Something's going to happen. Something wonderful. G'day fans and welcome to another exciting episode of the show. Now with a bit of luck, you've ignored the curfew thing altogether, the extra hour that you get on top of what we've had for the past month and you said, you know, stuff going out, you're going to stay here with us. So uh, hopefully that's uh, the case. Three people have done that already. So they've said, no, we're not going out. We're staying right home. And good old Carol, who gets complete freedom at midnight tonight because she lives in Ballarat, as does Jeff, as does Jeffro. And they get to go out and do stuff. Whereas MPS and myself, <laughs> we're stuck at home. So uh, there you go. How unbelievably depressing is that? And you know, Michelle's joining us already, which is very, very cool. And John, I've got nine people already. We've barely, Ooh. I haven't even stopped talking yet. How good is that? They're just rolling in like oranges. Holy guacamole, so much of the old curfew thing, eh? So there you go. Anyway, um, uh, it's a very, very big night tonight, as it always is in Nerdsville. And I've got to pass over or say, Lisa, hello to my cohorts, Jeffro and MPS. How are you, lads? Excellent. Most excellent, dude. Oh, very good. <laughs> Cowabunga, dude. Very good. All right, so Jeffro, we're going to be talking about uh, something very interesting. You've brought this uh, topic up, so uh, let's not muck around anymore. Get into it, old son. Yeah, well, I um, was just thinking of what things can I talk about? And one of the subjects was science fiction, comedy and space. And I will put a little caveat on this one. Uh, I'm trying to pick movies that weren't based on Earth. They're either set on another planet or set in a spaceship or set in space because there is really a truckload of different um, uh, movies that are basically for economical reasons um set on um on earth so hopefully there's some movies in here that you go you go i remember this and maybe a few that uh you you don't remember and there's definitely a few in there that you won't want to remember so uh not every movie's a gem so uh, gobble gobble turkey um so very good before the, you go any uh, further uh just very quick and narrow yeah, i don't expect everybody to read it all but you are correct a lot of people expect a big action movie and june is definitely not that so uh, that's probably one reason why it may struggle so uh but i just wanted to let aaron know that yes i did read the comments so very very cool all right so jeffrey you ready to rock and roll we are so we have our first movie so this is the uh the first one i could find and this was set in 1953 and there was a heck of a lot of low budget movies in the uh, the 50s and to capitalize on that we saw abbott and costello go to mars now the interesting thing about this one is despite the film's title they don't actually go to uh, mars so <laughs> yeah i know it's weird <laughs> it's, it's like sort of um what but um these um these two characters uh, lester and orville uh, uh, working on a um uh, a rocket site when um, they inadvertently uh, get uh, messed up with a couple of gangsters that have uh, stolen some uh, uh, astronaut costumes, robbed the bank, and uh, are looking to escape. And they escape in the uh, the rocket ship. So by pure comedic accident, you know, um, uh, Costello presses the uh, the start button on the uh, rocket ship, as you do, because that's all it takes is just a press of the button. And away they go off into space. So they actually uh, find themselves on the planet Venus. So Venus, um, as you would expect, is uh, uh, full of oxygen for them to breathe and is also um, uh, full of lovely women, including the Queen and all her uh, beautiful um, uh, army. So you mean, the, uh, you mean the Miss Universe contest beauties? That's yeah. right, actually, and that's where they did get um, a, a lot of the um, uh, the women from uh, Miss Universe, actually. So I don't know if you knew that or not, but that's actually the uh, the truth. Wow. Yeah, it's on the so, um, so there you go. Yep. And, of course, um, they uh, they fall in love with the, um, uh, the beautiful women there, but uh, they are sent packing when um, they tested uh, Costello's uh, fidelity and he started cracking on to one of the other women so it's like right we're not having you go back to earth so uh, that's the way the uh, the movie ended and at the very end after he's talking about it a big cream pie falls from space and lands on them so that's 
that's the sort of humour that uh, you're going to get from the 1950s, not overly sophisticated. So the next one, also not overly sophisticated. Hang on. You've got your reviews in here. So how are you going to Oh, yeah. Them? Sorry, we did have the reviews. So basically um, the review for this one is, alas, I can't recommend it because it misses too many marks, yet it still has some extraordinary things in it. So it, it has its moments, but it's um, not a great Abbott and Costello one. You can do better. And, and, and by extraordinary things, we're not necessarily referring to the Miss Universe contest beauties, by the way. I like how they say beauties, not contestants, not women, not ladies, beauties. So uh, yeah, beauty. yeah. make of that what you will. Very good. All right, next up. Yeah, next one we have is 1959 and the uh, Three Stooges have rocket will travel. So obviously they're a bit late jumping on board the, uh, uh, the space movie phenomenon. But um, here we find the uh, Stooges working as janitors because obviously they really never do much than more crappy jobs. And they're working in a space centre when, oh, oh dear, they actually um, push a button. Is this sounding familiar? And <laughs> accidentally blast off to Venus. Mm, hang on. Oh. You know why? Because I heard that the Miss Universe Stooges are going to be there. <laughs> um, the, the interesting thing with this one is that uh, not only do they encounter um, uh, a breathable atmosphere, but this one's quite interesting. There's actually a talking unicorn. I, I kid you not. A giant fire-breathing tarantula. Again, I kid you not. And um, a and a computer that wants to uh, to clone them. So. Um, no beautiful women in this one, but um, we had to deal with a, um, a megalomaniac computer. Uh, it's so, a very um, suggestive pose, isn't it, for the three guys? The way they're holding the what they're sitting on, and the rocket, and the and the ropes, and all the rest of it. It's a little bit um, inappropriate, you'd think. So I'm surprised the sensors didn't can, um, ask them to change it. But oh, yeah. it was a uh, innocent age, you know, sort of. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm sure they meant nothing by it. <laughs> what were <laughs> what they smoking? They I agree with you, Angie. Yes, exactly right. So there you go. Very good. And, what was it? and you want to know what the uh, review was? Yeah, so it has a good amount of slapstick, but the Stooges are older and there's not enough yucks. So basically this is them in their uh, later stages of the career, and uh, I think people were um, uh, uh, realising that. So um, Do you realise yeah. young people watching this will be going, not enough yucks, as in like what they looked at and said, oh, it's just yuck. It's like, no, 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 it's like yuck, yuck, yuck. <laughs> Isn't that yeah, right? Actually, that's a good point. It uh, because I mean, used to sort of have uh, curly go, yuck, 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 yuck. So that's what they meant by that. But did they have enough? Whoa, wise guy, huh? <laughs> now, uh, the uh, the next movie we have is a completely different tangent, and it wasn't hang until. Hey, hang on, hey, Pierce, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was going to say, do you think those guys after they they looked at the script and signed on a dotted line and went? Oh, really, this is what we're doing now. This is the sort of stuff, you know, we sort of, you know, you can't really slap and, you know, eye gouge and all that sort of stuff where you got, you know, back to back. You know, it's a bit sort of hard. They must have been desperate for money, I reckon. They, they were actually desperate for money. And the reason why they got to make this movie is because television was um, just pulling everything out of its hat to be able to put content on. And a lot of the Three Stooges shorts were shown. And it went over big time with all the kids in the uh, the late fifties and early sixties, and uh, that's what resurrected their career is uh, television. Very good. And as um, uh, Kelvin said, yeah, it should be launched on the Elon Musk. Uh, rocket, <laughs> uh, yes, very good. All right, we move on. Go for Jeffrey. So we're getting into something a little bit more uh, deeper, and uh, I'm sure a few people have seen this one. This is 1974's Dark Star. So it has the uh, honour of being directed by uh, now acclaimed director, John Carpenter, and also written uh, by Dan O'Bannon, who is most famously known for also writing the, um, uh, the movie Alien. So this one's set in the mid-27th century, and uh, the Dark Star is a scout ship. So what they've been doing is journeying out and trying to find uh, unstable planets in which to to blow up. So not a not a um, uh, a very uh, exciting job, and uh, the crew are just all terribly bored and and restless and such. 
and uh, this movie features a um, a bomb that's called uh, Thermostella Bomb Number Twenty. So when they yeah. actually get hit by, um, uh, I think it's a piece of debris, the uh, the bomb starts to think for itself, and it really wants to blow itself up. And then it becomes a case of they actually have to try and do everything to talk the bomb out of blowing itself up because obviously uh, they will blow up as well. So it's it is a really bizarre movie. I don't know how you can sort of uh, uh, describe it, but uh, uh, its sole purpose uh, in life was to explode. And as I said they had to try and talk talk itself out. I won't spoil the ending, but um, yeah, Dark Star, a low budget um, uh, black comedy. So here's a trivia question for people who are watching this show: What was the name of the song that was uh, played in the show? So uh, there you go, Benson, Arizona. Oh, that was for everybody else, not for you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Idiots. All right, so the, oh, they would have got it anyway. Uh, so the uh, review of this one is, it's a fun, bright and intelligent movie. It bears few signs of having been made on a low budget, yet the special effects are still pretty slick. And I think that's because these guys were um, uh, really fresh and um, really couldn't afford to do anything, but they are also very creative. So... Uh, uh, yeah, it um, generally gets um, good reviews, uh, probably more so than what it did back in the 70s. Yeah, it was originally a shorter version and they got extra money to film extra bits and uh, make the thing longer for a cinematic release. So uh, I think in the end uh, the guys went back and recut it and made it back to its original length. So it, there was a bit of filling and a bit of padding there. But, uh, yeah, something very, very different. Very good. Now, moving right along, we are uh, jumping into 1980. So uh, in a completely new uh, decade now that... Uh, Star Wars has come out and revitalised the uh, the science fiction um, uh, uh, side of things. This is a movie called Galaxina. So basically she is uh, essentially a robot that's on a, 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 a police cruiser and um, they are on this mission and this leads them to, and I, um, I'm reading this off the cheat sheet because um, it's hard to believe that this is actually a storyline. So the mission is uh, leading them into outer space uh, to a brothel full of alien women and a gang that worship Harley Davidson motorcycles. Hang on, there's more to it than that. It's not Harley. There are now out outlaw motorcycle gangs are banished to another planet. I can't believe I remember this right. And they actually have a motorcycle. It's the only one left, and they actually worship it as a god. And they actually call it Harley David. Harley. <laughs> Thank Harley. you. David. How do you remember this stuff? I have no I'm idea. Pathetic, that's why. So, you know, move on. So let's see what the critics actually had to say about uh, Galaxina. Oddly, for such a sluggish-paced, totally unfunny movie, Galaxina actually looks really good. And I think when they say looks really good, it's got Dorothy Stratton in a uh, cat suit. So for most people that tend to look at it, that's what it means by looks really good. And we discussed this in um, Sci-Fi Zone last year, but in the movie, she's actually, as uh, Jeffrey mentioned, she's a robot. But if you want to add in reproductive parts or girly bits, as it were, they are available uh, as an upgrade. Uh, so uh, there you go. <laughs> I thought that was just a very, very funny moment. It was one of the very funny moments of the movie, actually. So there you go. Very good. Now, the, uh, the next one we have is 1982's Flying High to the uh, sequel, or if you're in... Uh, uh, America it was actually called uh, Airplane. So for this one, a, a faulty computer causes a passenger space shuttle to head straight for the sun. So can Ted Stryker save the day and get the sh shuttle back on track again? So the team that uh, wrote this um, weren't actually involved in the original um, uh, movie. So uh, basically it's a cash grab by the uh, studios and with a much limited budget, I think you could tell. So um, I don't know how many people have actually seen this one, but uh, um, for all the people who have seen the original Flying High, I think only about 5% have seen um, Flying High 2. Anyway, let's see what the critics had to say. So um, the first five or ten minutes of this movie are generally funny. In fact, so funny, I really thought this movie was going to work. Unfortunately, that turned out to be a premature hope. So uh, I guess if you can see the first to five, ten minutes or so on uh, YouTube, just watch that and then just uh, count your blessings that you've uh, saved yourself about an hour and a half. It probably had a really good trailer and that would be about it, eh? So there you go. 
Can you get back on the next? Get back for a second, yeah. please. One more. That picture of of those of the two actors that looks like it's taken straight from the first film. It does. It, it, it? is. Yeah, it absolutely is, and that's sort of. Uh, how cheesy they wanted to uh, to be in terms of trying to get people to see this movie is to steal images from the first one. Surely you can't be serious. Uh, here we I go. Uh, so here's a question for Michelle for you, Jeffro. Are these reviews, are they from you or from someone else? These are actually reviews that uh, are from critics on um, uh, Rotten Tomato or otherwise um, uh, reviews from Roger Ebert. So these are not my reviews. These are the ones that... Um, and I said, come from uh, uh, the critics and generally uh, seem to be the most favoured one on uh, Rotten Tomatoes. Very good. All right. Okay, so this is going to throw you off because um, this is actually a movie called The Creature Wasn't Nice. And it's basically the movie wasn't nice. So uh, what we saw in this, in this poster here is that let's cash in on Leslie Nielsen because he's done so much in The Naked Gun and let's call it Naked Space. So you know you're in trouble when a movie gets um, renamed like that. So, uh, and it also got renamed again as Spaceship. So uh, just in case you uh, tried to avoid it with the first two movies, they rename it, and they're kind of hoping that you may actually accidentally watch it uh, by accident and, uh, and, and get to see it. So this is um, a movie that TV Guide gave the film one star out of four, calling it a misguided attempt at horror comedy. And I won't go into it, but let's see what the other review is. An inept comedy with preposterous monster. Made as a, fifth, a spoof of 50 sci-fi or something like that. Uh, I hated it, and others must have too, because they renamed it to Naked Space after the success of Naked Gun. Heck, it even included a rubber singing alien. So that was the uh, review from Rotten Tomatoes. So... Um, Seems like the only redeeming feature is a uh, rubber singing alien. And I think you can see that. Uh, I think I saw that on uh, YouTube. So if you just want to watch the, the couple of minutes of that, you go ahead. Don't watch yeah. the rest. It's kind of funny. You've got Naked Space and you've got air, uh, it was an Airplane 2, the sequel, and that's effectively in space as well. So you've almost got two movies that could have the same name. So there you go. Now, good. We, so we also have... Um, um, Ice Pirates. Now, uh, Ice Pirates is uh, a bit of a hard one to actually try and describe. So uh, these guys um, basically pirates, uh, and they are stealing ice because ice apparently is a valuable com commodity. But it unfortunately, is these days. <laughs> yeah. What with um, um, the um, what do you call it? Nuclear. Uh, sorry, global warming. So, but. Uh, uh, they are they are caught, and just before they are taken away to be castrated, uh, they are rescued by a princess. That makes a nice little um, uh, twist. The, pr the princess rescuing the guys. Now her f her father has been um, uh, taken away, so she enlists the two guys to try and find uh, her father, who is on a quest to find a, a mysterious planet. So um, uh, adventure ensues, and and such. Uh, the villains are chasing them, they, um, and they do actually manage to find uh, the planet, uh, which is called the seventh planet, and uh, the little uh, twist at the end is that planet was Earth. So, uh, yeah, Ice Pirates is um, one of those movies that um, uh, mostly did well on VHS. Um, if you're anything like me, you probably do remember seeing it for the first time on VHS. So let's have Speak. a look at the review. Speaking of seeing things for the first time, before we get to the review from Aaron, uh, yeah, maybe you could add a rubber singing alien as a fourth co-host. The problem is, Aaron, it'd probably be better than the three of us. Uh, and uh, Or alternatively, we might invite you to be the fourth host so you could be the rubber singing alien. So uh, you never know. You're lacking the big city. All well, right. I might get out a latex glove and that can be our rubber alien. <laughs> so everything about Ice Pirates is... Uh, is done in fun, as to be expected. It's just too much, and the result is overdone. So visually, it's actually very good, but uh, it's just a bit too uh, full on um, uh, OTT. Very good. Next, next one we have. So this is one that everyone tends to uh, remember, and of course, that's 1987's uh, Spaceball. So I won't really go too much into the um, 
the story in a way because this one's a fairly well-known one. So uh, it, we got a lot of different um, catchphrases and, uh, um, you know, may the Schwartz be with you and, and such. So let's have a look at one of the reviews that uh, we have. Mel Brooks will do anything for a laugh. Unfortunately, what he does in Spaceballs, which is a misguided parody of Star Wars, isn't very funny. And it's interesting. I was looking at all the other reviews on Rotten Tomatoes and they all echoed very similar thoughts. So uh, this movie, by all accounts, seems to be very much a fan favourite, but the critics really didn't like it. And I do remember when it came out, uh, it wasn't uh, much of a success with, with fans back then. So obviously it's gained a bit of a cult following. But, uh, yeah, that uh, review is very typical of... Uh, uh, what a lot of people did think of the movie. Well, MPS was one who didn't like it, as he's told us before, that when it first came out. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, I, I like all the jokes in it. Don't get me wrong. They're all the funny bits, like let's comb the, the planet and all that sort of stuff. That That's funny. But as a, the film as a whole, just I, it's not it's not a favourite, let's just say that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the fact that it came out in 1987, you know, sort of four years after Return of the Jedi, I mean, they could have sort of... Um, pushed it ahead and sort of made it a little bit more sort of uh, interesting. But by that time, the the late 80s and early 90s, people weren't really interested in science fiction all that much. I mean, the uh, the culture of uh, sci-fi dropped really low at that point. Yeah, it was sort of definitely a product of its time. And, uh, I don't, yeah, it wouldn't hold up today by any stretch, but uh, it, it, it was what it was. And, you know, I think because Mel Brooks had a track record of doing, like, comedies and all the rest of it, people probably said, you know, okay, we, we, we know what to expect. And there were moments that were, it kind of worked. But, uh, yeah, it's one of those things you probably watch once and go, yep, done with it. we move on. Speaking of moving on. Yeah, so uh, next movie uh, we've got is 1996. So, obviously, there wasn't that much comedy going on sort of uh, – between the late 80s and uh, the 90s. So this one is a bit of a low-budget movie called Space Truckers. So just to describe the plot, a space trucker, yeah, that's basically, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, that kind of trucker, um, is making his way through space, as you do as a space trucker, on his way to Earth with a uh, an unknown cargo. So uh, he suddenly finds himself being attacked by space pirates, Gee, where have I heard that one before? <laughs> and um, they, and then basically they are looking to try and um, uh, hijack five thousand disintegrator robots that are found in the the cargo. So, not the best um, clever story. Uh, this one in one of the reviews I read, I, I like this. It said it's such a cheesy movie that it sometimes makes Rocky Horror Picture Show look like The Godfather. I thought that was a really good quote. <laughs> So um, let's have a look at the other, let's have a look at the other quote as to uh, what we've got from um, Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, before we get to that, uh, apparently according to uh, Kelvin, uh, Spaceballs is coming out on 4K. Why is anybody's guess? So uh, yes, indeed. Uh, there you go. It is unquestionably terrible, but it is also rather fun. So <laughs> I guess that's a backhanded compliment. A fair but there was. Yeah. Um, it sounds like the reviewer doesn't really know what they think. So uh, yeah. it's terrible, but it's actually a bit of fun. I think it's one of those ones where it's like uh, you get a movie that's so bad that it turns itself around and is is good. So, you know, you've, you we've all enjoyed, you know, things like um, uh, Robot Monster and uh, Plan 9 and all those ones where they're really so bad that we actually really sort of enjoy them. So I think this one must be in that sort of uh, category. Now, now I didn't agree with this one, Jeff, right, but continue. Yeah, so um, not long after that, we had uh, 1997, and this is The Fifth Element. Now, I did sort of question about putting this one in because I didn't really sort of think it was much of a, a comedy, but, you know, it actually does sort of have um, uh, comedy elements in it. So... Um, I mean, it's one of those movies I won't obviously go into because people do um, uh, remember it uh, quite well. So um, there's a quote that was, um, I think, from um, uh, the director that said, so really the movie's ending is really a laugh on us because uh, we thought that the fifth element was some universal nuke or something. The fifth element is love. Ha-ha. They got us. So actually... Uh, 
it uh, I, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy the visual aspect of it. Um, Luc Besson is um, is a genius when it comes to visuals, and I think um, having uh, Bruce Willis in there uh, just added to that extra sort of uh, action comedy dynamic that it had. But uh, let's have a look at what the uh, the review we have from uh, Rotten Tomato said. Well, well, first off, I would certainly would not call it um, comedy by any stretch. You're right, it had comedic elements, but it's not intended to be a funny film. And, of course, you, based on your argument earlier, you said, oh, nothing that's set on, on Earth, right? But this, a lot of this is actually set on Earth, right? And so... Yeah, uh, I mean, that, that is... That is, yeah, that is a good point. And I had thought about that, but then again, it's also set on, you know, sort of the, uh, the, the spaceship and the planet. So, yeah, borderline one, it almost didn't make it, but... I thought, well, um, I'll, I'll throw it in because it will um, uh, bring up a, a nice little bit of discussion. Because that will also mean that Galaxy Quest should have been included, which it isn't in case anybody out there is wondering. So there you go. <clears throat> I, I would suggest that it's maybe a dry humour or, you know, black yeah. sort of thing, but, you know, I don't know if you can really say that anymore. Yeah. Uh, uh, one reviewer said it was um, comedy based on symbolism, so make of that what you uh, want. I'm thinking <laughs> sy symbolism. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, the uh, the review we have here is visionary filmmaker Luc Besson manages to create several of the most exotic and original characters for this magnum opus of sensory outlandishness. So I think that um, it's basically saying it looks really grouse and the characters are real freaky deaky. So that's that's what he's trying to say. I think Very someone good. got a thesaurus for for Christmas that year and yeah, used yeah. it. <laughs> So moving on to uh, something completely different, 1997's Leprechaun 4 in Space. So uh, believe it or not, there's there's not only the um, uh, three other ones uh, before that, but I think there's actually a five and six, and uh, Bill would probably tell me because he knows more about them than I do. So uh, it, this one's a deadly leprechaun. Well, go figure that. Uh, is in space. Go figure that. Uh, to woo a beautiful princess who is impressed with his gold, uh, leprechaun's gold, you know, the thing, and the desire for him, for it to be uh, separated from him. So that's pretty um, thin story premise, but it is hey, what it is. Here's a question for you. Was Warwick Davis short, short of a quid? Get it? Short of a quid? <laughs> <laughs> He's in I, I think he probably was. So the um, the only beauty of this one is that, it did, of course, poke fun of uh, a lot of other different movies. So uh, um, I have never seen it, but if I'm sort of really uh, stuck, I, I might just sit down and actually uh, see what I'm talking about. So let's see the review. Okay, so whenever someone compiles a so bad they're great movie list, Leprechaun 4 in space should always be there, right next to the likes of Troll 2 and Plan 9 from Outer Space. And that reminds me, you know what um, the next movie in space is going to be in the big screen? The Fast and the Furious. Oh, I thought you were telling me to go. <laughs> no, so it's it's like we're going to see The Fast and the Furious in space. So um, following the hot on the heels of Leprechaun 4, I guess, Fast and the Furious are going uh, in space. A wicked wicked. A wicked wicked. <laughs> That's good. I like that one. Very good. All right. Very good. So we uh, now move to 2002 and we have the adventures of Pluto Nash. So uh, the storyline for this one is in the future, a man struggles to keep his uh, lunar nightclub out of uh, bankruptcy. Now, uh, I remember watching this uh, not so long ago and it is um, it's dreadful. The, it's hard to believe that this actually had a budget of $100 million. You know how much it made worldwide? $7 million. So uh, uh, if this uh, wasn't a, a box office turkey, then um, uh, compared to Waterworld, I mean, it's certainly right up there. So um, you're not going to get a glowing review, I don't think. So let's have a look at the review. I was going to say, I like what um, uh, Ange is a bit of a fan. So uh, oh. maybe he contributed to that $7 million profit. <laughs> As Murphy himself decries in the first few moments of the film, horrible, horrible, horrible. That was terrible. <laughs> so, yes. 
avoid unless you like train wrecks for movies. So the uh, 2005, we saw uh, the uh, film adaption at long, 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 long last of um, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So uh, again, I won't sort of touch on the, the story because we all know um, uh, what that uh, story is all about. And I think most of us have probably seen it. Let's see what the critics had to say. Fans of the book will probably be a little disappointed with this, but anyone encountering The Hitchhiker's Guide for the first time should be thoroughly entertained. It's a very strange and very funny in the way that Adam's work exemplified. So that actually means that um, I'd call that a, a very good review. I didn't mind it. I mean, it wasn't spectacular, but I didn't hate it either. And I think probably that's why most people uh, uh, look at this movie adaption of the, um, of the, the book. It's probably right. hard because if you know the TV series that well, and because, and you know, that was the only on-screen version that I'm aware of for you know, a couple of decades, then to get this film version, even though Adams was involved with both of them, it's probably just hard to wrap your head around it if you're uh, so uh, enamoured with the original version. So there you go. Uh, just so, an, it's just a question, Jeffrey, sorry. That yep. picture, can you go back a slide, please. That picture, is that from, that's not from the, the film, is it? Because I thought... Uh, the lead was 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 um, oh, what's his name? The guy from Lord of the Rings, and you know, you had a roundish sort of robot. Is this? Actually, that's this a very good. Um, that's actually a very good pickup because, uh, I mean, it it looks like the uh, the movie poster, but um, it may not actually be the uh, the actual movie. So, uh, and the guy you're thinking of, the guy who played Bill by Baggins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you got him and you got Alan Rickman as the, as the voice of the robot, but the robot look, he looks more like a Power Ranger, um, and the girl in white looks more like a wannabe Princess Leia. So I'm well sort of done, MPS. I was testing everybody, and you, uh, you you, uh, you passed the test. Well done. I'm, I'm glad that you noticed my deliberate error. I like how we can't think for for shit. Any actors. And everybody reading this crap that we're talking about is just like pumping up the correct answers. I tell you what, we. Uh, Need a bit of an education here, so there you go. But uh, well spotted. There we go. Move on. There we go. So this one is a bizarre one. It's called Star Wreck in the Perkinning. So Captain Perk travels back in time to save the world, and he's stuck there. Uh, he's finding it difficult to convince the ladies that he is, in fact, a intergalactic space hero from the future. Now, this one actually um, made it on the big screen and was produced by five friends in a two-bedroom flat in Finland. So uh, amazing what you can do uh, uh, when you've got a little bit of resources and um, a bit of creativity. So, so I, guess, uh, I don't know how many people have seen this one. I guess you can say this film is Finnish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see what the critics have to say. In a 105-minute-long spoof by Finnish Star Trek fans, don't worry, it's not as bad as it sounds. Although having said that, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Um, is, uh, uh, William and Kelvin have said, is uh, about yeah, the um, Hitchhiker's Guide, is it a stage adaptation that you've got? It might be. And um, if I had Google in front of me, I'd probably be looking it up right now. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm, relying, I'm relying on you guys later on to tell me. Very good. So um, we then move on to 2014. And we have Guardians of the Galaxy. So, I, again, don't really need to say much about this one. We all know it and all, all love it. So let's see what uh, the critics say. Do they agree? Guardians is a great reminder that not all superhero comic book films have to be dark and moody. And uh, I think we'd all agree with that. Very good. And, yeah, uh, I, I got one comment on that. The only character who's dark and moody is freaking Batman. For crying out loud, everyone else is meant to be colourful for a reason and heroic and, and happy. So this is a bit of a moot point, I would imagine. Not all, not all superheroes have to wear uh, black leather and plastic. Yeah. But, um, and Great. the uh, final one we have is 2014, and it's called Space Station 76. So this is a dark comedy that... Deconstructs relationships aboard the Amiga 76 uh, retro futuristic space station. Uh, it's a low key indie film uh, and um, basically just 
not uh, not the great greatest movie you'd ever want to see. And let's see what the critics say. While enthralled with its own retro futuristic trappings at the heart of this pitch black dramedy, it has a mean streak. So um, not not the best comedy to uh, wrap up this uh, segment, but uh, as it had to include it. So uh, if you like sort of um, looking at um, 70s costumes and, 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 and set decorations and all that, check it out just for that. But otherwise, um, may the Schwartz be with you and thank you. So I think when it comes to some of the comedies, um, yeah, Galaxy Quest, even though you didn't mention it because you said it was Earth-based and whatever else, we'll probably rate right up there as being one of the most successful and popular ones. Oh, uh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Someone mentioned earlier about Iron Sky. Uh, that was also meant to be a comedy as well. Um, yeah. Um, set, set on Earth. Hang on. You talk over each other. Someone go first. Yeah, sorry. Iron Sky is pretty much set on Earth and the moon, so... Yep. I'd have to rule that one out. Yeah. MPS? I was going to say it probably depends on your um, point of view if you thought it was funny because there were some really funny bits in it. But, you know. Yeah, I agree. It's, uh, I, didn't, I didn't like it from a comedic point of view. I thought visually it was fantastic and had some interesting ideas. But uh, but I just thought I'd just check. Someone else had mentioned it uh, earlier on. That, so that's, uh, that's the king, the thing. So there you go. Very good. Um, good old William. I like, I like this. William, that always... Like like Ange and that always like these really obscure stuff, you know. Have uh, Space Station seventy six and enjoy it. It's like there's some people out there with some really really cool collections of stuff that most people never really get to see. So uh, which is kind of groovy. MPS, you want to say something? So, so when you get a sec, can you put up on the screen what I've got ready to show, please? It's just it's the poster from the Hitchhikers film. So oops, let's go to that. That's yeah, the actual that's poster the for the film. So. Yeah. What I think you had was maybe the title cover. I don't know, but that's the actual poster for the for the film. Hmm. That good. was the one I was looking for, and obviously did not get. <laughs> <laughs> right. We need to back you up, son. That's what we're here for. Hang on, but the thing is, MPS picked up on it, but none of the re none of the viewers did. Nobody else said, "Hey, the poster's the wrong poster." So everybody's very very quick at picking up the actors and the actresses from these shows. But when Jeffro makes a blatant error, the nerds are letting us down because they're not in the zone. What's the deal with that? They're, they're, they're part of Team Jeffro. So for the sake of, you know, it's backing me up, you know, they stum. <laughs> Very good stuff. All right, so we're going to – we've still got 16 people still watching. It's a bit of a shame we're going to cut this short, but uh, I think we're sort of just like running on fumes here at the moment. Um so uh, we'll see you all either next week or the week after. Um, anything uh, you two from the from the two lads finish off with? 1949, rock on. <laughs> Dude? Yeah, I've, I've got all six facts ready to go. <laughs> Very good. All right. And as always, most importantly, make sure you stay nerdy. All right. We'll see you next time. Okay. All right.